Hi everyone and welcome to the February meeting of Space Iceland. Uh, this is part of our monthly meetings where we meet up and discuss what's happening in the sector and at the office and then we usually have a guest speaker. Uh, obviously if you are involved in any project that you want to share with us, uh, send us an email. These meetings are quite open and informal. Um, with us today, today is James Sang from Sang, sorry, for from Space Tea. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the company and and what they are doing. Uh, it's uh, Space Tea, if I remember correctly, is the first private space company in China. I hope I'm, I hope I'm not bullshitting here right now, but James will correct it then if I'm wrong. But we're going to start by talking a little bit about what's going on at Space Iceland and then we'll start the talk. Um, so uh, as you might have noticed from our Facebook and, and newsletters, uh, it's time to apply for the Student Innovation Fund again. Uh, this is something that we do tend to take an active role in. Uh, obviously the fund is sponsorship for students, not for Space Iceland. Uh, we contribute by, by helping them out, providing space to work and, and sort of um, opening our network to them and providing guidance. But uh, as, um, as some of you might know, this fund is quite deficient when it comes to uh, sort of spin-offs and, and, and students starting something new. It's a relatively small fund. It's up to three months wages for, for them where they can focus on, on their own project and they have to design them, them in cooperation with some partners uh, like Space Iceland or our partners. So we've found it um, part of our work to make sure that there are uh, quite a lot of applications from related to space or derived from space. Um, so this year we've had uh, a massive interest. We did have an introductory meeting with students, just sort of general meeting, but I think we had 40 uh, attending, 45. 45 attending, and then uh, quite a lot of emails. And we've worked with the students and now have a few projects that we are uh, well the students are writing applications from one would be one is related to copernicus obviously quite an important uh, cooperation that iceland is a member of uh, where they are uh, building a, uh, using uh, machine machine learning to analyze and work on uh, landscape images from copernicus uh, and they are documenting Mars and Moon-like surfaces in Iceland that could then be uh, utilized to uh, for training and field trips in Iceland. Uh, there is a project that we are working on and actually um, where Space Iceland has kind of more of a direct role where we're looking at uh, cybersecurity for the space sector and hoping to come up with some guidelines and, and some, some analysis on, on best practices for our partners and ourselves. Uh, as you know, Iceland does not necessarily rank highly when it comes to cybersecurity. So we think it's important that we start to think about this, especially given in our field, which is predominantly uh, cross-borders. Uh, another student came with us with the idea of researching and analyzing uh, environmental regulations in Iceland that could impact the sector. Uh, we're happy that we got access to the National Archives uh, from the, the Friends for Space Launches in the 60s. And we are now working with two students on uh, researching that categorizing the, the, the archives and trying to kind of understand the history and, and also hopefully working with the local community where it happened to document uh, some first-hand experiences from the people that saw it. There are two projects related to uh, educational outreach for children 
that are, are related to the space sector. Uh, these are two groups that came to us. And one that I think we should mention is um, um, uh, a project that examines the mental health and social abilities of those that have been uh, have experienced the isolation of space. This could relate to habitat design in Iceland. There are a few other projects that are not as far along, but there's also an architecture project that came to us uh, and has to do with looking into designs of, of habitats on the moon and Mars. Um, there isn't necessarily much more to tell. I mean, this job is, as you know, it's space is just time consuming and you do a lot of uh, bits and bobs that tend to steal more time than you want to. Uh, so things are actually going quite well. Uh, we believe that that we've entered 2021 sort of stronger than we did in 2020. And 2020 in general, even though it was quite a hard year, was quite a good year for space in Iceland. So I think we should just start by introducing, um, I think we just should start by introducing uh, James. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about his work and space team. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Tor. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to be invited to uh, uh, give a talk here uh, about the uh, uh, space tea, about activities we are doing in China and globally. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Fantastic, works perfectly. It works, okay, great. Uh, the, comp uh, the company I represent, okay, it's a Space T. I think uh, before I talk about Space T, I probably say a few words ab ab about myself. Okay, uh, right now I'm the uh, CEO of a Space T Luxembourg. And the Space T Luxembourg is the international headquarters for Space T. And uh, I, uh, before I joined Space T, actually I worked in Canada for space for about like 26 years. And uh, I was involved in many, many kind of space programs, including like uh, uh, International Space Station, like uh, people, a lot of people know Canada Arm. Actually, I worked on that. And then like uh, in Canada, we have Radar Set program. I was involved in Radar Set uh, 2 and also RCM. And uh, there are many kind of uh, like uh, small satellites as well. And uh, one of the things, okay, I was proud of myself is, uh, okay, uh, was involved in uh, this uh, Osiris X, is kind of a NASA mission, okay, to uh, go asteroid and bring samples. Okay, yeah, I uh, learned a lot and from my kind of uh, a professional experience in space. So about like a year ago, okay, I uh, left uh, uh, the uh, Canadian Space Agency, okay, and then went to Europe and set up this company. And uh, it's a new space company. It's a uh, uh, very different from what I had experienced in the past. Then I probably share with you my experience of what, why so it is so like different. Uh, before I talk the company, I probably talk a little bit about like say the space in China. I just uh, attended a, a kind of like workshop or conference organized by a digital foundation from the UK. One of the uh, topic there was like uh, uh, the changes and also the challenges especially now the whole world is seeing there is a kind of like a competition, like say between US and China. Okay, the reason for that is the Chinese pro space program has uh, progressing very fast. They have achieved a lot. So, I mean, that actually put the question in everybody's mind say, okay, how are we going to work with China? How we handle that? Okay, is that competition or is that cooperation? Very interesting question. And uh, with that background, and then, uh, yeah, now came a lot of, uh, 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 like say, uh, private companies. Before 2015, there were no uh, uh, private space companies in China. All the programs, okay, were handled or executed by like state-owned, uh, like big corporations, like this China, uh, China uh, aerospace science and technology corporation, they call the CASC. 
Okay, they build almost everything. Okay, like satellite, uh, spacecraft, uh, landers, rovers, okay, even instrument and even launchers. Okay, they dominate the whole market in China. So that's why these days when I talk to people, okay, talk about like Space T, the first question they ask is, say, is that real kind of a, a private company? <laughs> Do you have any kind of a, like state, uh, like a, a government background? No, it is uh, like a private because uh, after uh, in, uh, 2015, the Chinese government introduced a new policy. They call it like a commercial space policy. That policy allows private investment, private company, okay, to get into space business, to build like launch vehicles and satellites and uh, to do the operations, even like uh, applications, provide services. And probably some, some of you okay, know, uh, like say a private kind of rocket already being launched in China. Okay, a few of them kind of failed, but I think two of them, two of them were very successful. They launched the satellite into the orbit. So with that background, Space T actually started in 2016. It's only probably a few months after the government introduced the new policy. It's a, a privately funded company. Okay. And uh, this company mainly started with like say uh, CubeSats. And uh, they started with like a, a 3U and a 6U. And then now, okay, they like we have the capability to build 12U, even large satellite, like say 185 kilogram small sat. And uh, so far we have launched uh, 21 satellites since like say founded in 2016. That is a very remarkable kind of achievement because it's kind of a startup company, new space company. Over the last five years, we have launched 21 satellites. And uh, yes, I have to say, this is a kind of like significant achievement for a, a small company. We are still small. So far, we only have like 90 employees globally, including people in Luxembourg. And 70% of employees are kind of engineers and scientists. And we have like three locations in China. Changsha is in central China. That is uh, where our headquarters is. And uh, we have facilities in Beijing, mainly for R&D and then uh, some like uh, uh, office there. Then we just started a new uh, like facilities in uh, like uh, uh, West China, uh, Sichuan province called the Mianyang. And there we're going to build like say uh, probably production facilities to produce satellites. Uh, overseas, we have uh, uh, one uh, location which is in Luxembourg. Okay, that is the international headquarters uh, taking care of all the international business and collaboration. And in the future, for example, if we have opportunity to work with organizations in Iceland, okay, that will be through, like say, Luxembourg. The main capability of the uh, company is like say, uh, manufacturing of satellites and then uh, uh, operate the satellite. And then our satellite actually uh, are kind of like a low cost because that's the goal. That's uh, uh, our CEO who uh, founded the company and he believed say, okay, low cost is the way to go because uh, uh, he was inspired very much by SpaceX, by Elon Musk. Okay, and he believes if that can be done in US, the similar things can be done in China. Uh, now in terms of like services, okay, yeah, we, we build satellites. However, we are service provider. Okay, we provide the, like say, uh, we call the uh, satellite based kind of a, a payload hosting services. And also we provide, uh, we call it the in orbit demonstration and in orbit verification services to uh, like say the clients from the whole world. And because in Europe, especially in Europe, there are a lot of needs for this IOD LV. Uh, also we are building a SAR satellite, actually we already launched one sat SAR satellite and then we want to be uh, the global kind of uh, data, uh, satellite data service provider with our uh, SAR constellation. That's something I'm going to talk today. Uh, from this chart, you can see uh, this uh, shows you the so-called management team. Okay, the top one is our CEO, okay, and he's very young, okay. 
and uh, in night in like 2016, and uh, him and also uh, our CTO, okay, the two guys they started this company, okay, and then uh, they put some some of their own money there to uh, as seed funding, and then build like the first uh, uh, first is six U satellites. Uh, this team basically, okay, they are, they have a lot of like uh, space experience in China. They involved in uh, Chinese like uh, uh, space programs, even like a human space flight program. Okay, and uh, yeah, you have myself there and then I have uh, a lot of experience from uh, like uh, uh, international uh, 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 space programs. Uh, this little kind of uh, uh, picture uh, shows you, like say, the past missions we have. Okay, uh, we launched, like say, 21 satellites with 12 launches. So sometimes we launch two or three satellites on the same rocket, and sometimes like just one, sat uh, one satellite. And uh, so far we already have a kind of like, a, uh, we call it a satellite fleet. Okay, and we have like 3U, 6U, 12U, and also we have like say this 185 kilo small satellite, basically it's a SAR. Okay, that's going to be our major kind of uh, activities in the future. We're going to build the constellation based on this design. And the, in the past, most of the missions are like a science missions. Okay, we launched the many kind of a science payload and then uh, help, help people to do like a, a science uh, experiments or like uh, uh, like exploration, okay, in orbit based on our satellite. The many technology demonstration, and we also launched uh, like say four like optical satellite, uh, like with cameras to do like Earth observation, and also one sa satellite recently. Uh, these are kind of like major achievement, okay, and that we are very uh, proud of. And the first is okay, we worked with a, a university in China called the Tsinghua University. Okay, Tsinghua University is like say, kind, kind of like a MIT in China, the top university, the top engineering university. And also they have a lot of like science program. And then we flew a kind of a soft, soft kind of X-ray uh, detector, okay, and to detect X-rays from uh, like uh, deep space. And this research and achieved like a very good result. And then the result was published uh, like say on uh, Nature Astronomy, the top journal for like astronomy in the world. And then with like all satellite uh, on the like cover page. So you can see like the left, uh, uh, bottom left hand, you can see that picture. Okay, that is like the, the cover page on like a, a Nature Astronomy. We also flew a, the world first iodine based electric thruster. The thrust was built by a French company called Thrust Me. Okay, but however, we worked together and then uh, made a very successful uh, like a flight and also in orbit demonstration of that technology. And uh, that is kind of a major achievement because that's the first one, okay, first time and people flew iodine based kind of a, a propulsion system in space. And also uh, last, uh, uh, no, December 22nd, Okay, we launched our, our first SAR satellite, but it's also the world's first meteorized C-band SAR satellite with the fixed ray antenna. Uh, before us, okay, you, you probably like uh, know, like you have like an ISR, you have a Kepler, they launched like a small SAR satellite, but however, uh, they are all X-band and then they do not use like a fixed ray antenna. Okay, but we use the fixed ray antenna. So that is a kind of like a achievement and we are proud of. Uh, this picture shows you the platform we have, okay, used for our missions. This is, is all kind of like a, a standard product. And the first is the 6U, okay, you can see that. We use the 6U a lot to do science missions and also uh, technology demonstration missions. So this 6U, of, of course, because it's like standard 6U kind of design, so the mass of that satellite is about, like say, uh, 10 kilos, and then, but it can generate, like say, uh, uh, like at least 34 watts power, it's a lot. And also we can configure that to achieve like 100 watts power. If we're, like say uh, the customer have need for like more power and then we can do that. 
And uh, then we have 12U. The 12U, uh, we launched 12U just uh, last year. And uh, uh, it has a mass about like two, uh, 20 kilo. And then also the power is about like 50 watts. And 50 watts power for like the 12U, I think it's, it's, it's very good. And it also can be like say, uh, configured to achieve like say, uh, like a 100 watts power. So the, the bottom one is our saw, we call it like a TY mini saw. And uh, this, uh, this is the satellite we launched uh, like uh, last month, uh, like, uh, yeah, a, a month ago. And uh, that will be our kind of uh, uh, probably uh, the satellite going to be used for the uh, constellation in the future. So this show you this shows you all kind of facilities in China, okay, and then uh, some of them is kind of like old pictures. Uh, you can see uh, we have a very good kind of a clean room, okay, and then uh, we have like a, a facilities to test the satellite. And uh, of course, when you see the the satellite, it's like toys on the table. It's different from from like say uh, if you go to uh, NASA, okay, even you go to Canada, okay, we have clean room there, okay, big clean room with the satellite. But here, and then we integrate satellite on the table. It's like a little bit like, say, when you do satellite in a u university. But however, this is a controlled environment, it's a clean room, okay, because the size is small, and then you really can do it that way. But for the big satellites, like say, our sun, okay, then yeah, we need a dedicated facility for the in integration. And uh, because uh, we are a low cost satellite manufacturer, so we believe in like say uh, mass production. So this is a uh, so-called uh, the concept of the uh, production line of the satellite we are building. We already uh, build a, a kind of like a, a prototype and uh, test it like say uh, last year. And then uh, we are developing the capability to manufacture like say, 100 satellites per year. Okay, this is uh, in progress. And uh, yeah, the ground station, because we have so many satellites in orbit Okay, and also we're going to have a lot of more in the future, then we need the ground stations. Right now we have ground stations in China, and then we are looking for opportunities, like say, to build ground, ground stations in other countries. So that's why our CEO came to like Iceland like in 2019, okay, and the contact like uh, some like uh, local uh, people, like say uh, universities or even some government. Okay, and then we'll see if we, uh, we can move forward with that project. Uh, this is our team. Okay, you can see, and uh, this is a young team. Probably the average age is, uh, I, I think, probably around the 29 or 30. Okay, we hired a lot of students. And then uh, when they joined the, uh, our company, they did not have any kind of like space experience. Okay, but we have very good like system to train them, okay, and to make them, like say, uh, the, the best engineers in space. So people were very kind of like excited there. And so that's why we can like make satellite very quickly and uh, very kind of like effectively. So what I want to talk uh, is uh, like say a saw because the saw re represent our future. And then we want to uh, uh, build a saw constellation. Okay. And then to provide this data service uh, to the whole world. And the saw is important uh, for like earth observation and uh, for earth, earth observation, for Earth observation, okay, but many people understand, okay, you have like a different ways to do that, okay, and then a lot of the time people use, uh, 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 like say, optical cameras or spectrometers, okay, based on uh, optics to do that. It's a, it, it, it works beautifully, but it has some limitation. The limitation is it's very much depends on, okay, uh, the weather and also depends on if you have a light can kind of like a shine on your object because it depends on the reflected light from the object. If you do not have that, then you have no kind of uh, uh, images. So that's the limitation of optical satellites. And uh, in some areas, okay, even only 20% of the time you can do imaging. 80% of the time you cannot use uh, like say optical satellites to take any images especially in this uh, kind of uh, equatorial areas because a lot of uh, like uh, 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 rains, uh, clouds, okay, and then it's difficult. 
to do, especially I just uh, talked to uh, uh, people from UK, okay, and then they need, they need to do a survey of the airport uh, to find out uh, the high kind of like a structure because uh, there is a, a, a law policy there, so you cannot have a very high uh, structure around the airport. And uh, they planned to use uh, uh, like an optical satellite for that. And then they found out it's not doable because <laughs> I mean, the sunny day is only like 20%. You, you can use the satellite 80% of the time it's not usable. So that's why they are thinking about okay, using SAR to do that. And the, probably I don't have to say much about the uh, side itself because uh, I think many people understand the side, especially in Iceland. I think uh, Iceland is uh, a very good user of SAR images. And the uh, SAR basically is uh, like say, is active kind of like sensors. It uh, emits like say microwave pulses, okay, to the object. And then that pulse is being kind of like uh, scattered back. And then uh, uh, the, uh, Antenna actually uh, like say, records the like echoes and then uh, do analysis and then form image. Okay, so this picture shows you like say uh, a side looping airborne radar. That's how it works. And the problem with this one is uh, okay, you do not get like a very good resolution, especially in the long track direction, because uh, you need a very large like say, antenna to get good resolution. Okay, so that's why, okay, the new technology came say, okay, we can do that. We can do spaceborne because uh, the satellite actually flies at a very high speed. Then you have, have virtual, this virtual aperture and people call it a synthetic aperture. That, we, that will give you a very good resolution. So you know, the best resolution we can achieve these days is like say 0.5 meter resolution. It's almost comparable to optical satellite. So advantage of using like a, a radar uh, for like a EO is like it's all weather capability. Okay, no matter you have clouds or you have rains or you have snow, okay, it, you can always like say uh, do the imaging of the object of the earth. And then a day and night, okay, 24, like say 724, you can get the images. And uh, yeah, and the no, no effect of uh, atmospheric constituents. Okay, sometimes, you know, if, if it's optical, then you have to do like say calibration correction because the atmosphere affects uh, the light. And uh, it has a, like special characteristics, like say uh, uh, di uh, dielectric kind of properties. It depends on that, then you probably can detect so-called the, the, the substance, okay, of the object. And the surface roughness, it's a sensitive to the surface roughness and it's both is good or bad. It depends on uh, like what you want to do. Okay, if it's ocean wind speed, then you can use that. So that's why uh, like countries like Canada, okay, we launched SAR, okay, for like say maritime monitoring uh, because uh, SAR can do that. And the optical satellite actually does not have that capability. And also the distance, okay, because it's active device Okay, you can like emit the microwave uh, pulses and get back. Then you can compare the phase shift. Uh, that gives you a lot of uh, like information about uh, the earth, about the object, and uh, also man-made objects. So that's why SAR has been widely used in like say uh, defense and the national security. Another advantage of SAR is it has the capability of uh, like a penetration. Okay, depends on the applications. Okay, you may say, okay, I want to penetrate, for example, like through the leaves of trees or even the soil. And then saw can do that, but not optical. But saw is not perfect. And uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of like difficulties. So that's why even though people understand the saw has a lot of advantages, but however, and it's still not widely used. Okay, the most difficult part is like the in interpretation of the image. Okay, it's not like straightforward when you look at an optical image. Okay, you know what it is. But with the saw, you really do not know exactly what you're looking for, you're looking at. So you need like processing. So the technologies are kind of like uh, uh, developing very fast. Then uh, when Tor was, uh, uh, was doing the introducing uh, introduction, actually I heard say, yeah, like say for example, like machine learning, okay, AI technologies, okay, even the student are working on that. I think that's a good sign 
because those all those technology actually will uh, like uh, uh, enable like uh, new applications and new probably algorithms to uh, process like saw images and then, then make saw probably uh, um, more easy to use. And you have other effect, okay, like a speckle effect, okay, a topographic effect, and the surface roughness, those kind of things. Then you have to do, like, say, uh, 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 image processing to get rid of them. Okay, still, yeah, a lot of challenges. But I, I think, like, say, the new era is coming. So that's why you you can see a lot of uh, uh, organizations or companies, okay, are planning or even like building a sub constellation for that. And then I think that will be kind of like complementary to uh, uh, like the system, for example, like a planet. They have this real time, okay, uh, to monitor the earth, but however, all that is like say optical based, has a lot of limitation, but that if can be complemented by a sound network, okay, then we have complete information of the earth, probably like a 724. I think that will be very good for our earth. Uh, when we talk about the song, okay, you, uh, because it uses microwave pulses, now it has a frequency. And then all these are kind of like frequencies uh, used for like a radio for microwave. The most popular, uh, like say, uh, frequency for song is like say L band, C band, and X band. So today, most of the songs use uh, one of these uh, three bands. Okay, there, there is specific reasons because for these three bands, they already defined or found good applications. And each band is good for certain applications. No band can cover, like say everything. And for example, like X band, because uh, it's, uh, you can see here, it's a wavelength is, uh, uh, is the shortest one among three, is uh, 2.4 to like 3.8 centimeter. So it can give you very good resolution. Okay, if your application needs very high resolution, like say 0.5, even like a less than 0.5 meter, then probably X band is the choice. But however, X band can only like say measure the surface. There's no penetration. Okay, and it may not be good for some other applications, which you need like a lot, like say probably uh, penetrate into uh, the. Uh, the substance, even like, say, for example, the, the soil. Now, L band is on the other hand has the longest wavelength. Okay, it has a lot of capability for penetration. Okay, but however, the resolution is not uh, uh, very high. Uh, the other thing is uh, is quite heavy because of the wavelength. So, C band is in between, and uh, it has applications uh, and covers both. Okay, but not like say. Uh, go to extreme as a good as good as like X band in terms of uh, uh, like uh, uh, resolution, okay, spatial resolution, or as good as L band in terms of penetration. So that's why you can see, okay, some like uh, especially the government, okay, they choose C band for their saw. Like in Canada, we have like three generations: radar set one, radar set two, and the RCM or C band. And the ESA, the same thing. Okay, they are saw in many C band, including the Sentinel One that that is widely used. I think probably in Iceland they also use like uh, images from Sentinel. It's a C band. In terms of like imaging mode, why that so? And uh, each saw okay uh, normally has like three kind of uh, modes for imaging. Okay, the first one is like say, we call it like stream mode. Street mode is like say it's saw has a, like a, a fixed pattern for uh, microwave like emission. Okay, and then when the satellite flies by, okay, it kind of like a scan the surface. And uh, then another mode we call it scan mode. Scan mode is when you have like a large swath, you want to cover a large area, okay, and you want to steer the beam, okay, and then to scan in different areas. And another mode is what we call it a uh, spot mode, spotlight mode. Spotlight mode is like say, you really won't have like a very high resolution. Okay, you actually control the microwave beam, okay, to like say a stare at one spot. When the flight satellite flies by, okay, it gets signals probably like say over a period of time of that spot. And then you get a very high uh, like a, a resolution. 
So that's why when you like look at the, like a, a, a saw data products sheet, okay, you can see most of the saws they 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 say they have this uh, uh, three modes, and including the saw from SpaceT. It's weird. Yeah, I already mentioned to say, okay, saw has some advantages. Okay, you, if you compare the optical images with the saw images, you can see, okay, the optical image actually are affected by the weather, okay, and then by time, but, but the radar image actually is not affected. Okay, even you cannot say, okay, it's the image like is taken from night or from, from like a, a snowing weather, it's, it's, it's the same. It has like surface penetration. Okay, the surface penetration actually has a lot of uh, like uh, advantages, especially for example for agriculture and for other things, even for military purpose. And sometimes, uh, yeah, you you need uh, that uh, penetration. Oh. Oh. Why? Why is doing this funny thing? Another. Uh, advantage of using saw is the saw can give you like say interferometric uh, images and also the three three D images interferometric image actually and then it's very good to detect the deformation of the surface or of the object okay and then uh, uh, right now more and more applications uh, okay have been developed okay and can use that kind of information and uh, 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 many saw actually they are providing images for that purpose. Yeah, that, 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 that's what I say. Uh, the de deformation. And, uh, you know, like so people have built a lot of inf infrastructure, okay. And then uh, really, I mean, the infrastructure has kind of risk. You have to monitor its deformation, its kind of health. And then the saw, in saw, the interferometric uh, saw can be used for that purpose. And also uh, uh, to detect, like say, probably uh, the, the probability of natural disaster. Okay. And then that can also be useful. Now this gives you the uh, information, some information about our saw. Okay. And then we, as I said, we already launched our first saw. Okay, it's a kind of like fixed array antenna. This is different from others. The beauty of fixed array antenna is, uh, okay, on the antenna, you have so many kind of a, a little kind of like uh, uh, modules, or we'll called TR modules. So each module can actually like, transmit and receive uh, the beam in, in independently. And then you have a controller to control each module and to form the, uh, the, the beam in the different format. Uh, so that give you, uh, like say, uh, better control and then you have uh, like better accuracy and also uh, uh, the mode, different kind of, uh, 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 we call it uh, uh, polarity. Then also is C-band SAR, okay. And then it's a uh, 5.4 gigahertz, okay. And then uh, the bandwidth uh, is between six and 300 megahertz. The total mass of that satellite is only 185 kilo. It's very light compared with like a, a traditional SAR. Okay, that weighs about like say uh, 227, like say 100 kilos. And then we can achieve like say up to one meter uh, resolution in spotlight mode. Then what we can provide is like say, uh, we can provide SAR image and also in SAR and then 3D images. Uh, as I already mentioned, say the satellite was already launched. And it was on a Chinese launch vehicle called the uh, Long March 8. And then that was uh, uh, the first flight of Long March 8 in uh, uh, Wenchang, China. So this shows you the picture or actually the design of the satellite. Uh, you can see, you only see one kind of like a, a, a one type of panel. When you see other SARS, normally you see like two, two panels. One is like SAR antenna panel. The other is a, a solar, uh, like a, a solar panel. Okay, but in our design, okay, we combine these two panels together. That sig significantly reduce, reduce the size of the satellite and also uh, mass. Okay, 
And then of course that creates the, the complexity of like operations of the satellite, but we find a way to do that. And then we have some, some patent on that design. And the, the table underneath, okay, we did a comparison with the, one of the large sa satellite from China. Okay, it's called the GF number three. So GF number three uh, is a, a large SAR. The mass of that satellite is like say uh, 2,779 kilos. The design life is eight years. Okay, but it has a, like a high orbit, it's 755. Uh, kilometer. Of course, it has all the three modes. And then our SAR, we call the TY SAR, it's only, okay, there's, uh, it should be like, uh, when at that time it was de uh, designed for 170, but the, the actual weight is 185. The design life is uh, like five years. Our orbit is a little bit lower, it's 500 uh, kilometer. But in terms of like a resolution, you do not see much difference. In, in these two satellites. But when you look at the price, okay, you can see any, how many times difference in terms of price. So that's why the new space will bring like new technologies and new way of solutions. And I believe that will significantly lower the price of like space data because space data is still very expensive, especially SAR data. We are talking about, like, say, probably a few thousand dollars per image, and uh, so that's why most of the users of SAR images are kind of uh, government users or research organizations. They have funding from the government, but as uh, consumers, probably the price is is something you you cannot afford, and we want to change that. We want to make uh, these uh, images actually affordable to many people, including like the farmers. Uh, this is uh, like say our kind of imaging mode uh, for our satellite. Okay, we, we have like uh, three modes. Okay, strip, spotlight, and uh, like scan. And then you can see like spotlight, we have one meter resolution. Okay, and then give you a swap five kilometer by five kilometer. And uh, uh, yes, and the stream mode will have three meter and then with a swap of 20 uh, kilometer. And also for the scan, we have the two scan modes. And you can see the numbers there. For the first SAR, because uh, uh, it's still a first uh, satellite and then uh, uh, actually we, one of the uh, objective of that uh, mission is to test, okay, our design, our technology. So that's why we only use like a single uh, polarization. So we have like a VV, but the, the satellite we are building right now, okay, that's going to be launched this year. And then we have like a multi-polarization, like other SARS, you have VV, HH, VH, HV, okay. And then that will give you a lot of information about the, uh, the, the object you are going to like uh, uh, monitor. This is uh, the pictures, okay, shows you the actual satellite. Okay, so this is uh, not a painting, it's real pictures. And uh, so you can see it. And then uh, uh, the picture in the middle is the time when it was launched. Okay, so it was taken from the launch site. And then, yeah, you have that rocket there. So this happened on like uh, December 22nd, uh, 2020. It was launched like say December 22nd, 2020, five days after that, we got the first image from our satellite. So th this is the first image. I think it's, uh, it was taken over uh, the, the, the coast of uh, South America. Okay, I did not get the information exactly location, but it's that lo location. Now this is the second image you can see, this is from uh, Tennessee. Okay, uh, from US. This is strip mode. You have like three meter resolution. And like two weeks ago, we got like uh, images for spotlight mode. Is the, 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 the high resolution image about like one meter. This is from a city. Okay, and then of our headquarters, Changsha. So from here, you can see all these high res like buildings. Okay, and give you I mean, a very good feeling about the like say the resolution of these uh, uh, SAR images. 
And uh, this is another image for like spotlight mode. So as I said, okay, the plan is not just to launch one satellite and provide services. Okay, and then uh, we did like market survey. Okay, and then we found a lot of like needs for kind of like uh, saw images, especially they want to have a very short revisit time. To do that, then you need, you need to build a constellation. So that's why now we have a plan to have a constellation. So this is, a, I think it's a, just, a, well, we are going to build that constellation in different stages, okay? Even for each stage, and then we have like different phases. So this is a probably for stage one, okay? When we're going to have like 56 satellites. Now 56 satellites going to have, uh, uh, like I say, four sub constellations. So four sub constellations means we have like four orbital planes. And uh, then well, we plan to like say, deploy that uh, uh, in like say a, a four phases. So phase one will be like say 14 satellites, okay, with the inclination angle of 28 degree. And phase two will be like say 20 satellites with like say 40 degree inclination angle. And phase, phase three will be like uh, 16 satellites. Okay, uh, then uh, phase four will be like six satellites of like uh, a polar orbit, sun synchronous orbit. So sun synchronous orbit of, will cover the whole world. And, but our first satellite is sun synchronous orbit. So like uh, in Iceland, if you have need for like all images, okay, and for research or even for commercial purpose, okay, we'll be able to provide you with the images. So this just show you, okay, the 28, 28 uh, degree, uh, like inclination angle, okay, and mainly you can see it covers kind of like uh, 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 the areas that are close to equator and the part of China, because uh, China will be our main focus. We have a lot of like needs from from that, but we also want to uh, like provide services to uh, other region of the world. So this is like forty degree, okay, and then they go further north. And uh, but still, I I think it's not good for like Iceland yet. <laughs> and then after that, and then we're going to launch like say 19 degree inclination angle. Then probably will be like say uh, a nine, uh, 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 six satellites for SSO. And uh, this will be uh, good for Iceland. And but uh, I mean it depends on the needs. Okay, we may change the faces. Okay, if there's a lot of like requests and needs from like uh, Europe. Okay, and uh, from like uh, South America, they need like sat images. Okay, and we may like deploy this uh, six satellites, probably the second phase, not the not phase four, probably phase two. So I mean that we have not made the, like a final kind of a decision yet. So that that is the plan. Okay, as I said, okay, now uh, the goal of that constellation is to minimize the revisit time. What we want to do is we want to build a constellation, okay? Then we will give like say a revisit time any point on the earth less than like two hours. And right now, okay, nobody or no kind of like a satellite constellation can do that yet. And then uh, this just show you, okay, depends on where uh, the region is. And then you have different uh, like say uh, revisit time. And uh, like say, for example, like say on, if on equator, Okay, and uh, we, so we probably the satellite will, I mean, cover that region, like say, uh, 51 times. Okay, and the maximum like a uh, period of a uh, revisit, revisit time is less than like say 90 minutes. And uh, if it's uh, like a north 10 degree latitude, okay, then you have like 80 minutes revisit time. And like say 23 degree, you have 50 minutes. And then you can see, okay, from that page, and mainly it's focused on, like, say, China for this, uh, we call the, uh, the first stage. Then the idea is that we want to cover the whole globe, and then uh, probably we'll need, like, say, 300 uh, satellites for that. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, that is our kind of a mission. Okay, I think uh, that concludes my uh, pre presentation. Uh, okay, oh, let me, how, how do I stop that? All right, so how do you stop the sharing? Uh, yeah. Well, oh, stop sharing, so okay.
down there. I found it. All right. Uh, thank you, James. That was uh, quite interesting and quite impressive. Um, yeah, I don't know really what to say, but uh, I think what we should do is uh, take take questions. Uh, we have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what is it? So, does the data received from multiple ground stations in different locations? Can you send it to me so I can read it? Yeah. So we have a question from yeah. from whom? Jinkai. From Jinkai. Jinkai. Yeah. Um, well, I'll. I'll read it. Send it to me. Okay. Does the data received from multiple ground stations is the data received from from multiple ground stations in different locations? Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we need to receive the data from different locations uh, uh, over the whole world. Okay. Right now we have ground stations in China. We have five ground stations, and then we uh, we actually are discussing with uh, a few service providers to use their ground stations to uh, like uh, receive our own uh, uh, the data of, from our satellite. But meanwhile, we have a plan to build ground stations like uh, overseas. So, so that's why like say, about like, two years ago, we came to Iceland, okay, to talk to uh, local people there to see if there's any possibility we can build a ground station there, okay, to re receive the data. And then still, I mean, we, uh, if there's opportunity, we still want to explore that. And the, the, the reason for that is uh, we know like Iceland, okay, uh, you have need for the data. Okay, it's more convenient if we have local ground station and to get data down there and then you can use data right away instead of uh, using other ground stations and get data transferred. Okay, so there's a lot of advantages. Uh, okay, the answer to that question is just yes. Uh, well, um... I, I do have a question. Uh, how readily available is Space T to for cooperation on on research or with students or universities? Because I mean, you have this yep. new technology, and you could the, the, there could be some uh, spin-offs from it. Yes, actually, we're, we're quite open to that, and then uh, we uh, want to look for opportunities and to support, like the organizations or even people, even students in Iceland or to do research, okay? And then we can form kind of like a partnership or, or like say collaboration, okay? And then even we can probably can provide like say free images to people in Iceland, okay? For research purpose, of course not for commercial purpose. For commercial, yes, there's a cost on that, but we can like di di discuss. So that's why before uh, this uh, talk and our CEO talked to me again, say, because we had contact with some universities in uh, Iceland and uh, some research organization. So we want to reconnect because now we have the good like the images. Probably those images will be good for like Iceland for like the research purpose. <laughs> that's good to hear. So, I mean, I think the background that we just mentioned is a uh, space D and space Iceland. We've had quite a sort of, on, I would say a good uh, relationship communication over the last few months, exactly yeah. discussing these things. So uh, are there any other questions at the meeting? Have you received any? Uh, I think you might have overwhelmed people with information a little bit, but it was, you, um, I, I imagine that you guys are very proud with your process in, in such a short time, I would say. Well, yeah, I think yeah, I, th I think we are doing the right thing, and uh, we are very confident in the business model in the way we are doing things. I can give you an example, like this uh, satellite, because I worked on radar set two. It took us like ten years to build the satellite, but our first saw, okay, we only spent like, one year to build and launch it. So you can see the difference, and then we look at the images. The quality is about the same. As the image from like Sentino one and the radar set two. All right. Um, I think. Uh, well, I think since there aren't any more questions, that is it for this month. But uh, we will. I we we should call and and discuss discuss afterwards, James. Sure. All no right. problem. Yeah. So I'll, I'm going to end the live feed now. Thanks everyone that joined and uh, again. Uh, you're always welcome to our monthly meetings. They are sort of sector oriented, but open to everyone. Next month we have we have Petr from the Czech Space Alliance.
uh, and which I think would be will be quite an interesting meeting. The Czech Space Alliance is somewhat similar to what Space Iceland is. Obviously, the Czechs, uh, the Czechs are more advanced, both in the policy, political sense, and technical technical abilities than Iceland when it comes to space, but they are they have gone through the process that we are trying to go through here in Iceland and have been exceptionally supportive to Iceland. So that would be a good meeting. Okay, right. good. Thank, thank you, everyone.